Firstly, my uh, apologies again for not being able to uh, address you in the uh, German language. Uh, I will try to keep my English, which is, after all, ultimately, if you look back through the centuries, a kind of German dialect that went a bit wrong, uh, rather slowly. Uh, we need to ask, I suppose, two questions when we are uh, attending a festival such as this. First of them would be, what is the basis of the festival? And the second, perhaps more teasing, maybe more obvious, would be, why hold the festival uh, at the wrong time of year? After all, are we not now in the month of Rajab, uh, coming up to the traditional festival of the Mi'raj, the normal Muslim practice at this time of the year is to recite a mi'arajiyya. Throughout the Muslim world, traditionally, there are these long uh, invocations of, of praise, thanksgiving, often quite beautiful. You can look at them on YouTube and so forth of the, the mi'arajiyya, and many dozens of our great poets have commemorated that. But somehow, the event in our calendar that slips from its original context and can be celebrated at any time is the, the Mawlid, Mawlid, the celebration of the birth of the Holy Prophet, Salawatullahi wa salamu wa ali. So, as good a place to start as any would be this. Why is it that even though human beings, for some strange reason perhaps, like to be reminded of things through the calendar, that this is something that we do not need a calendar to remind us of. We're not in the month of Rabi al Awwal, far from it. Well, the reason for this has to do with, uh, with joy, has to do also with universality. That is to say, cosmically speaking, the actual moment of the day and the actual day of the week and the actual month of the year in which this particular uh, individual, alayhi salatu wasalam, entered this world of space and time is rather less important than what it was that he brought. He was not a celebrity in the current sense. Nowadays, people tend to want to learn about celebrities. They celebrate celebrity birthdays and they look in Hello magazine for news of celebrity breakups and dieting issues and uh, divorces uh, and usually those celebrities are celebrated because they're celebrated. They're famous because they are famous. This is one of the oddities of our age. Earlier ages, not just Muslim ages, celebrated human beings because of virtues. Now, it might be uh, spiritual virtues, or it might be martial virtues, or it might be the foundation of a nation state. Uh, but those people always did something or thought something substantive. Nowadays, the people we talk about and gossip about most are famous for being famous. There's something about the modern world which is really the triumph of form over substance. An age which, in many ways, came about as the result of some very hard thinking in this country, as much as anywhere, in the 18th and the 19th centuries, now produces majority cultural forms which aren't really about ideas or thought at all, but are just about form, an age of, of the surface, where people don't cultivate the virtues and their inward intellectual acumen or the capacity to memorize poems or whatever it was that their grandparents were doing, so much as they cultivate their outward form. Who has got the new tattoo? Who has bladed their eyebrows? Who is following the new look for the hijab? It's all to do with surface. And sometimes our people are as bad as everybody else. The move from the Barton to the Zahir, as it was, is almost uh, an inevitable part of being caught up in the slipstream of an age which is about matter and no longer believes very much in the supernatural. But when we 
breathe the atmosphere of an event such as this, uh, we recall something different and an age which was, by most measures, a more serious age, where human beings were celebrated and became celebrities because of what they brought and who they were, not just because they were famous. And so what we celebrate here is not just another historical name, not just another Wikipedia entry, not just another milestone in the story of human progress or human deterioration, depending on your preferences, but rather what we're looking at is the uh, advent of a form of perfection which gives human beings hope. Raja Amal Hofnung, we just had the, the beautiful poem, something that human beings really crave. Maybe the thing that we crave most of all, apart from love, I guess, and love is, in a sense, a kind of hope. We need to have hope. We need to uh, get out of the inevitable realisation of our own demise, ageing, death, bereavement, sickness, the usual concomitants of being frail organisms subject to the irresistible claws of gravity, and to have a horizon, to look forward to something that is brighter, an age that focuses only on matter is necessarily pessimistic because matter is subject to gravity. Its nature is entropic. It turns downwards. Nowadays people are in need of hope. And so they find it, they think, in dreams. They might log off from reality and log on to a virtual reality. Maybe some intriguing... Uh, high graphics computer game which allows them to enter a world in which they can live again, they have an immortality the usual rules of gravity can be suspended this is an age of escapism where people are constantly logging off from reality and logging on to something that's going on on some little screen on a handheld device we crave hope and that's a legitimate craving insofar as it is part of the way we have been made, our misage. But matter alone, materialism, science, cannot really give us that. Technology gives us as many worries as it gives us ways of being comfortable. With every technological breakthrough, there is a cataclysmic threat somewhere on the horizon, whether it be nanotechnology, or genetic engineering, or nuclear energy, or whatever it might be, there is a threat and a hope of greater comfort that that technology brings, and more interesting entertainment, is somehow blunted by the realisation that the thing is also cataclysmically dangerous. Matter in itself, and our human brilliance in manipulating matter, and understanding matter, does not itself bring about a process that is intrinsically hopeful. It doesn't deliver us what our poor, weak, mortal souls most crave. And this is the gift of faith. But it is not a facile gift. Because the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, like all of the great sages of human history, comes bashiran wa nadira, good news, that's what we like to hear, but also a warning the news that, in fact, we are not subject ultimately to gravity, but that there will be a, a hushal and a nushal, and we will defy gravity by rising and standing again in some sense that is described to us in the picture language of Revelation, but whose reality now, with our veiled sight, is very difficult to conceive. Something that the heart craves and fears at the same time. But that, nonetheless is the horizon that religion offers. But of course, it also reminds us of the immense moral seriousness of our status as the only entities in time and space that we can see, as far as we know, uh, that carry the, the, the yoke of the amana, 
alast to be robbikum. Am I not your Lord? We remember it, and the consequence of that is the amana that the uh, offer to the heavens and the earth, wal jibal and the mountains. For abaina an yahmilnaha wa ashfaqna minha, and they refused to carry it, and they were afraid of it. Wa hamalaha al insan, and the human creature carried it. Innahu kana zaluman jahula, he who has proved to be a tyrant and a fool. That's uh, self-evident. Look at the headlines. Tyrants and fools rule the world. Tyrants and fools in the White House, in the Kremlin, and everywhere. This is what we are. Raised up to this extraordinary, miraculous state of not only seeing the world, but being able to think about the world. Something which nothing else in creation that we can see can do. Able to create categories to do equations, to work out the movements of every atom, this no ennobling which has been given to the sons of Adam, karamna bani Adam, and we end up being tyrants and fools with it. And that goes for the technologists and the scientists and the infinite number of stupid and wasteful uses to which we put the finite matter of the world through our employment of it. Such is the human tragedy. Such horizons. The horizon, first of all, of perception, of knowledge, of consciousness, of knowing good from evil, of poetry, of theatre, of architecture, of the wonder of uh, the human condition. This nobility, this aristocratic nature, which is our birthright, and at the same time our stumbling Allah says, we showed him the two paths. Yeah, we've guided him to the two paths. And there's the path that leads upwards to the true fulfillment of what we are made to be. Noble men and women. And also the path that we tend to find interesting of looking at stuff in its own right rather than as something that shines with the light of infinity. And nowadays, there's so much stuff, and it's so brilliantly pulled out of the earth and made into entertaining equipment for our amusement that we're really looking down all the time. We're on the lower of those two paths, of those najdain. Human beings, yeah, with their phones, you look down. It's about looking down. Stuff, matter, entertainment, the ego, what's cool, what's new, it's not what ennobles us. This is actually nothing new. And the reason why we hear the story of the Sira, often in the context of the formal recital of the Maulid, and we love to hear it, and we love to hear it again, is that even though it's the story of events in a dusty Arabian town long ago, very far from our current coordinates, at the same time, it depicts universals that are absolutely relevant to us and our current horizon, and our fear and our hope. The virtues and the vices were there just as they are with us today. Seven deadly sins and the human fada'il these are constants of the human condition. So what we're looking at when we read the pages of the Sira, and particularly not when we read all hundreds and hundreds of pages, whatever it is, of Ibn Sa'd or Al-Halabi or Ibn Hisham, but some distillation of the prophetic story that focuses on the quintessential, what we get is something uh, akin to the highest of human art. That is to say that the highest point of the artistic human creativity of any civilization lies in its great narratives where a great soul explores the mystery of a world of light and dark and of virtue and of vice and the endless comedy and tragedy of the human condition. It started way back with the Greeks, Aristophanes, Euripides, and the others on the stage 
and we're all on a stage and the curtain will fall on each one of us but in that period we act out our parts and what amazing things we turn out to be. Shakespeare, Goethe, Schiller, so many others also somehow wake in us the sense of the inherent depth and brightness of Benny Adam. There is a lot to us. There is a nobility, and there is also the possibility of being as fellow Serpilene, the lowest of the low. And in that, we find our contemplation. There is no way in which you can read those works and not see that there is more to the world than meets the eye. And the human creature, this Khalifa, this strange lump of clay, within him there is something luminous, something eternal, and to the extent that we detect that, we detect the source of the eternal. And then we start to grasp that strange way with which the Quranic narrative begins, with that prologue where the angels are commanded to bow down to Adam. When we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down, Illa Iblis, except Iblis, uh, he was proud, Abba was Takbara, he refused and was proud and was of the rejectors of the unbelievers. In the Kafirin, he was the only one at the time, more were to come. Within this lump of clay, but a few days after losing life and being buried in the earth becomes about the most disgusting thing in the world. This uh, clay, this mud of which we're made. There is something which the great human souls of history, when they haven't just been looking down, but looking up and looking around and looking within, have discerned and have discovered. There is so much in us that there must be something beyond us and there must be something above us, and also below. The demonic is a real thing. The angelic is real. We are caught between heaven and hell. We are suspended between virtue and vice. Every moment of our lives, when we're conscious, we can choose between a good thing to do in that situation and an ugly thing to do. This is the human condition. A cow, a sheep, an elephant, a whale, a mountain can't do that. The heavens and the earth can't do that. But human beings are strange, rotting creatures. We can do that. And part of the reflectiveness of human beings, in those moments when, for instance, they don't have a mobile phone signal and they have to look around themselves and remember that they're alive and that they're mortal and that the world is really strange and perhaps it would be nice to think about it sometimes. In those rare moments, the thing that most reminds us of Huck is ourselves. Sanurihim ayatina, we shall show them our signs, fil afaq wa fi anfusihim, on the horizons and in themselves, hatta yatabayyana lahum annahul haq, until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth. Ultimately, Allah is the one who guides. He is the one who gives us these moments of thinking that this reality, this consciousness, this experience, this creation of the heavens and the earth is so bizarre and so deep that it demands a transcendent metaphysical explanation. It doesn't explain itself. And those moments, those are moments which are divine gifts, nafahat, exhalations from ar-Rahman, moments that we need because those are the moments when we're really alive the rest of the time we're comatose really just pedaling along heading for the grave amusing ourselves as we go that's not really being human when we're reflective when we think uh, that's when we start to become interesting and maybe the point at which the angels start to think that maybe we are worth bowing down to after all so the most extraordinary thing in the world is the human thing. That's why in a university like this you have the Naturwissenschaftliche world of natural sciences and then you have what you Germans call the Geisteswissenschaften, the, the sciences of the spirit. 
That doesn't sound very scientific in a scientific age. What's the spirit got to do with everything? But modern universities have this. Sometimes they say the humanities, but the German Kantian phrase is, is better. This Geist, there is something that cannot be explained. A, a laboratory is not the place where you get to grips with Goethe or Shakespeare or art or architecture or music. There's something about us that uh, is about a beyond. And the contemplation of that is the beginning of real humanity. That is to say, humanity that has a vertical as well as a horizontal axis. And that's where religion steps in. Because if the thing in the world that is most strange and most interesting, human beings, and you can write about Shakespeare forever, you can't write about a star forever, the sum total of the equations is, is finite, but the depth of the human soul just keeps on going. If the most amazing thing in the world is our poor, sorry, rotting selves, then that manifestation of human perfection that most shows what we could be is going to be the most interesting thing we could ever contemplate. Everything in itself bespeaks the divine. Everything is ayat, signs of the compassionate, in the way the heavens and the earth are created in the succession of night and day are signs for people of insight. Yes, for sure. When we look at the beauty of virgin nature, our souls intuit that there's more going on here than meets the eye. Unless we're really sick. Or, as it were, blind. But that is at its most intense when we contemplate the miracle of a transcendent human being, a person of real virtue, a person of real beauty, a person who is not distracted endlessly by the latest app, but is fully centered, grounded, integrated, body, mind, spirit, if you accept that tripartite identification of, of the human nature fully and perfectly integrated in a way that becomes astounding and becomes a sign. So just the presence of that person is a reminder. And if you have been in traditional societies and had the good fortune to be with people who have spent their lives working on themselves and becoming miracles of the ethical miracles of what we call ihsan, doing the beautiful, in their presence it's very easy to believe because there you have the proof. There's no explanation for this miracle except that it's a miracle. So we need those people. That's the sign because we look at the mountains of the Iftila for Layli Wan Nahar and our hearts are still muddy and rusty and we don't see through them the way we ought. But we need a stronger mazhar, a stronger theophany, a stronger manifestation because we're really weak. You know? Big cataract in both of our eyes, the light shone into it by the optician has to be really strong because we're almost blind in this age, an age of near complete spiritual blindness where people are preoccupied with and drunken by everything apart from what really matters. Uh, a sh bright light has to shine. Now some people, alhamdulillah, are still able to reflect on nature and see what's going on intuitively. Some people, by looking within themselves and by walking through the halls and tunnels of their spirit, come to the realization that this is not nothing and come to al-haq. Some people, by the sheer graciousness of the Lord, are shown things unexpectedly and are, as it were, forced to come to al-haq. And that too happens. Some people catch a glimpse of it, perhaps in a dream, or perhaps in some strange concatenation of events or some other sign that is given to them, and this continues, because the reality is, from our perspective, 
the thickness of the barrier between us and al-haq is really thick kathif seems to go on forever a million years at least but from the perspective of the one who is nur samawati wal ard light of the heavens and the earth that barrier is infinitesimally thin that's the paradox allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives himself many names and very often those names come in pairs al qabid wal basit wal khafid wal rafa al muiz al mudhil and so on and that's the nature of creation it's a balance between opposing principles but one of his names al qarib doesn't have an opposite it's worth reflecting on that he never calls himself al ba'id the distant never in all of the quranic verses and the million hadith does he say ana ba'id no ونحن أقرب إليه من حبل الوريد. We are closer to him than the jugular vein. That's full time. But we're really a long way away because we're phoning or whatever in our little kind of animalistic way, wasting precious time. What a waste! But he is always al qarib, and not qarib in some physical sense, because any physical closeness. Incorporates some degree of distance, but Qareeb in the sense that he is ma'akum, aina ma'akum, so with you wherever you may be, absolutely present. Allah is munazza, transcendent, other, but he is also uh, the one who is the one of tashbih, likeness, close, Qareeb. And we need to see al qarib in the things that we see, and ideally in the things that we hear and taste and smell and intuit. In everything in the world, we need to be able to see the depth, the added dimension. Otherwise, it's a bit of a waste, and we become like, say, a robot that has a scanner or an eye and sees things. And hears things probably better than we do, but there's something missing because it sees, but it doesn't see. Very often we human beings see, but we don't see, and that's a shame. Because what's interesting about things is what made the things, and what sustains the things, and the ground of all being, and the meaning of things, and the morality of things, and the beauty of things. That's what's interesting about stuff. Otherwise, it's just. Different arrangements of atoms, which atoms are boring after a while. But meaning, ma'na, not hiss, that is interesting. So we need to be able to, as it were, turn on the colours in the world, uh, get out of the, the the black and white monochrome and into a world full of colours and full of light, to be able to see. And this is the joy of the believer. Wherever he turns, for them I watch Allah. There is the face of Allah. And the Quran says this. Yes, Laysa kamitli he shape. Nothing is like his likeness, and he is other than anything we could imagine. But wherever you turn, them I watch Allah. There is Allah's face, Al Qarib. What a shame we don't see that. How different we would be if we did see it. Maybe once every ten years, or once a year, we have a good prayer, or some tajelli happens, or who knows? Allah gives people things. Usually, they're quiet about them. Sometimes they're not even Muslims, but they are given to see cracks in the carapace of darkness. Allah Karim. But if it was all the time, imagine if we were walking through this world. And everything we saw, we perceived as being another marvel of the creation of Al Haq to Baraka wa Taala, a dikro da'im, constant remembrance. We'd be like a different species, something quite different. Not an occasional remembrance. Oh, it's time to pray, pray, and then a bit in the prayer, but constantly, without a veil. What would that be? Well, that is what we are for, because that is what we were. In that ancient time, 
the angels bow down to that lump of clay because that lump of clay was truly Adamic, taught all the names, saw the names alone in creation. And we tend not to see the names in creation but just lumps of stuff. What a shame. Like the robot, the drone, seeing things but not seeing. So what we need is to acquire that perception. And it's possible because it's what we originally were. And it's possible because it's what we were, even in this world, in a certain way that was really before we knew about religion or had words, little babies see it. Small children have this sense of the intrinsic amazingness and wonder of the world. And this is part of the way in which Allah has honoured women and the daughters of Hawa in that they more than the men, engage with the child in its fresh from paradise or wonder at the world. The baby in the pram is amazed to look at its hands. 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And it's right. I should be doing the same thing. It's pretty amazing, but I'm used to it, so I lose out on thinking about something amazing. My friend's text is probably not amazing, but the human hands. Talk to any medic. But the fact that I can contemplate it is even more amazing. So we're born as being in a state of wonder, awe, amazement, heva, ta'ajub. That's the state of the child. Very spiritually healthy. And it's the state of the fitra. And then somehow the lights go out and we start to become uh, a little bit robotic and automated and boring and take things for granted that are definitely not there to be taken for granted. So, what we need, to say this again, is to be in that place where we are most likely to be reminded of this, which is the only thing that really matters, matters, vikrullah. And we find this, because we're too weak to see it in the mountains and the heavens and all the other amazing things that are out there, and even the two billion images from the Hubble Space Telescope take us some of the way, but still we're distracted and... There's the rust on our hearts of which the scripture speaks. What we really need is to be in the presence of someone who is already there. Why? Because we are social beings and we are osmotic. The Arabic proverb says, salim sarraq. The sound in human nature is a thief. In other words, if you're a reasonably undamaged human being, you will be inwardly influenced by the kind of people that you're with. If you're in prison, in a cell, for a year with a bunch of murderers, it will pull you down, inevitably. If you're in uh, the Masjid al-Aqsa, every night during Ramadan, it's going to pull you up. You'll be a better person because this is our nature. We are social beings and we communicate with, on quite a subtle and a deep and intuitive way, with others, not just speech, not just values, not just body language, but some other deeper alchemy that is to do with the one roh meeting another roh and has all kinds of amazing noble human manifestations like the desire for justice or being in love, those things. It's, it's deep. Human relationality is another sign. So we need to be in the presence of somebody or some bodies who have recognized al qarim who look around them and they see uh, not the shadows so much as the light that is casting the shadows. Those who look at the, the windmill and don't think that the sails are turning of their own volition, but they see the wind as well. In other words, people who see things according to haqa'iq al-umur, the reality of things is the prayer of the Holy Prophet. Show me things as they truly are. So humanity needs those people because it's easier when we're with them. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our weakness, that we won't really figure out enough about him just by wandering through the earth and looking at his material signs in nature. And we won't really know enough about him just by reading a book 
even though his books are the best books and have that dimension of limitlessness about them and you don't get bored with them, they are all signs. But still, we need something as well, which is the bearer of the book. Mm. To use the academic jargon, the bearer of the Qur'an and the Qur'an itself are intertextual. In other words, the divine signs that appear in the mazhar, the theophany, the manifestation of a perfect human being, insan kamil, are symbiotic with the book which also contains the divine signs. And this is a deep thing which is almost impossible to put into words. Uh, but our ulama have, have always known this, that there is uh, a relationship between the Holy Prophet and the book which he bears. <laughs> he is mentioned in Surah Al-Qadr. And that intertextuality is something that we also need. To read the Qur'an properly, for it to move in our hands, for it to start to unlock its secrets, we need to have a relationship with the bearer of the Qur'an. And this is there in the esoteric plane also, as well as the exoteric. The exoteric scholars will interpret the Qur'an according to the ahadith, asbab al-nuzul, the ahadith which explained at which point in the seerah a particular verse came down. He is connected to the text and gives us the full sense of its meaning. But there's also this inner thing, that he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the only place in creation where this book could be revealed. It's like that verse about the amana, the mountains kind of were terrified. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his book, capital B, where does he place it in creation? On a mountain or in a shrine or some amazing place? No. Nazalahu ala qalbik. He sent it down upon your heart. Hmm? The heart of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the only place it can be. Because it's tremendous. The word itself, which can shatter the earth remember the first experience of revelation despite the strength and the youth of the holy prophet والسلام, and his, his yaqeen still the experience on ghar hira the angel squeezing him jahad, until I almost expired came to the limit of my endurance and then he comes down to Khadija radiallahu anha yarjufu qalbu and his heart is kind of palpitating and shaking. It's a shattering experience. We're going to send down to you a heavy word. Mm, crushing. We can't really imagine what that might be if we have a good relationship with Allah's book and he opens the pages for us, as the scholars say, we start to get a sense of the haba and the majesty and the mystery of the text. But he saw it all and he received it, the first to receive it, alayhi salatu wasalam, upon his heart. So what is that human being whose heart is the only place in the vast cosmos with its billions of galaxies which can carry this word? What is that? Who is that human being? The religion which is focused on the on the, the presence of the Holy Prophet and much of this is a mystery and many of the things that the Muslims have historically believed or intuited or dreamed or sung or written about the Holy Prophet are uh, attempts to express in the finite net of human language something that is uh, on the brink of transcendence and where language starts to crack and break how can we really talk about that heart upon which the word itself descended? Do we really know what experience he, he went through? His wife says later, uh, 
I saw him when the revelation was coming to him on a really cold day and his brow was pouring forth sweat. Do we know what that could mean? Well, no, not really. But what we can see is that this is not an ordinary human soul or an ordinary human being. Bashar, for sure, 100%. But still, one that represents the full possibility of that Adamic perfection to which the angels bowed. And when you think about it, that's a strange paradox. As the religion of Tawheed, probably when you have your graduation ceremonies at university like this, maybe you have, in England anyway, maybe you're too modern, but in England we love to dress up and sort of kiss the hands of the vice chancellor, and there's a lot of bowing. And he takes off his hat, and you take off your hat, and you hold somebody's finger. We love that. Academics are very childish. And there's the bowing. And you can write in advance to say, for religious reasons, I don't want to bow down to the Chancellor of the University at my graduation. Thank you. Bowing is a big thing for monotheists. It's only for Allah, Jalla wa Allah. But here we have the angels bowing down to Adam. And Iblis with his wrong theology says this is a wrong commandment and there's a mystery in this and there is in the human being a mystery but where we consider the perfect human being والسلام, we are considering the point at which the theory of religion which is that human beings can go back to that point at which the angels bow down to a human being of clay it can come again in other words, there is hope. We're not just clay and going to be buried in clay and amuse ourselves while we wait. We can ascend. We can have our own mi'raj. There can be ama an amazing horizon of hope. And this is not just some small eccentric message, but it is the message really in different forms, often distorted forms, of the major world religions and the seers and the sages and the prophets and the noble spirits of humanity. They've said, look through the surface, look above. Don't be distracted. The more you follow the lower self, the harder it will be for you to be your true self. Everybody has said that. No religion has said anything else. Allah says, those who struggle for us, we shall guide them to our paths. We said earlier that this vision of perfection and beauty comes from divine guidance. We can't really work it out ourselves. It's too much. He can reach down, we can't reach up. But there has to be the mujahada, the effort, which means that we have to struggle against the gravity and struggle against the truths and struggle against the temptations and thus we become noble. If you follow your lower preferences, you're not a noble human being. And so when we consider the noblest human being, Akramu khalqillah that ever was, alayhi salatu wasalam. A nobility that in many ways is shocking to the limited sensibilities and preferences of a limited, dark, clay-bound age, but a true, magnificent, full, virile humanity. When we look at that, even though we can't be with him, alayhi salatu wasalam, we are changed a bit. We hear his story. Young people celebrating his story in, in poetry and in song. And somehow we remember. We can't be with him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Not in any sense that theology could possibly imagine. But just the remembrance that there was a human being in that dusty Arabian town who took those people out of their shadows of polytheistic manipulation into full monotheism. Who gave them a law. Who gave them monotheism, who gave them hope, yeah. and so much hope, they had not believed in life after death, which is historically unusual. They hadn't believed it, they hadn't even had that hope in their dusty Arabian lives. He gave that to them in abundance. Jannatul Firdaus. What uh, an extraordinary horizon of hope. And also hope that in this world things could be better. There could be such a thing as justice. There could be such a thing as law. There could be such a thing as akhlaq and adab. 
Uh, and turn them around. We can't be that, alas. We can't be with him and feel the faith flowing through us just by looking at his faith, as happened to so many. They just looked at him and they believed. But by hearing, and by hearing from the poets who spent their lives uh, enraptured in love of that perfect human being, we can start to straighten ourselves out and we can start to reflect in a more focused and, as they say nowadays, mindful way about our messy existence. The presence of perfection is a sign. And perfection, given our imperfections, is sometimes a hard thing to conceptualise, something we intuit Sainthood, virtue, beauty, these are things that are difficult to write about, but you recognise them when you encounter them. And so that's why we have these moulded celebrations, this milad, this mevlid, this molats, this, it happens in every Muslim culture. This practice of reinvigorating people's faith by reciting back to them, in a beautiful literary way, in their own language, the extraordinary uh, moment when perfection as a human being entered the world, that sign entered the world, which was the critical moment, the, 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 the breaking of the new day. And those people who are sunk in the worst kind of superstition and occult manipulation and fear uh, were given hope. So that's what the Molid is about. And this is why the ulama, past and present, have said, whichever way you do it, uh, make sure that the purpose of it is to bring people back to the love of God and the love of the Holy Prophet, Ali Salatu Salam, because that's the essence of what our religion is about. Beauty is an axiom in our civilization. And we've had so many beautiful cultural forms. Look at how the Maulit is celebrated in Indonesia, Java, for instance. They call it Sekaten. If you can ever witness it, it's a very amazing extraordinary, beautiful thing with shadow puppets and volcanoes made of sugar and they really go to town in, in Java. And then the Moroccans have their way and the Bosnians have their way and now I see that uh, in Germany they have their way as well. This is just part of the way in which the Ummah uses this, this method of reminding people where faith comes from and where hope comes from. Because his message, alayhi salatu wasalam, in a time of darkness, was a message of hope. And the big hope. The hope of eternity, of paradise. The hope that there is meaning. The hope that despite every difficulty and affliction that this world uh, is witnessing, that everything is ultimately under control. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. So this is why we do it not just in Rabi' al-Awwal, but we do it often in different forms. And there's hundreds and thousands of different maulids and the Turks like Suleiman Celebi and the Bosnians have something from Safet, Bektovic, and the Indonesians have their Sekaten and every tradition has it. Um, and it's axiomatic and a true witness to authentic religion. Because what religion is, is about waking us up to the inevitable realization of our decline and the inevitable recollection of the divine. So may Allah bless you all and forgive me for speaking for too long and in the wrong language. And I uh, call down his blessings and the blessings of his holy prophet and all of his prophets uh, upon you and may he protect you always and guide you and make all your affairs easy, inshallah. In both the worlds. Barakallahu feekum, wal afu minkum, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.